Hello and welcome to The Hearing. I'm John. And I'm Scotto. And without any further ado, on to this week's album, which is from 1982, Spring Session M by Missing Persons. Missing Persons is an American new wave band best known for their breakthrough singles, Words, and Destination Unknown, as well as for the unique costumes worn on stage by vocalist Dale Bozio, which have been very influential, riffed off by Lady Gaga. Um, <laughs> I think everybody who grew up in the 80s saw Lady Gaga and said, Dale Bozio. <laughs> yeah, I could completely uh, forgotten that, yeah, but huh. she totally yeah. ripped us off. <laughs> The band was founded in 1980, 1980 in Los Angeles by guitarist Ron Cucurullo, vocalist Al Bozio, and drummer Terry, De- Der- uh, Terry Bozio. Dale and Terry Bozio met while working with Frank Zappa, and they married in 79. Uh, Cucurullo encountered the pair while contributing to Al- Zappa's album Joe's Garage. Bassist Patrick O'Hearn was also a former member of Zappa's touring band. Um... I referred to them uh, before we started recording as uh, the world's most overqualified new wave band. Um, Spring Spring Session M is the band's debut studio album, the title of which is an anagram of the band's name. It was released on October 8th, 1982 on Capitol Records, produced by Ken Scott and features Dal Bozzi on vocals, Ron Kirk Rulo on guitar and vocals, uh, Chuck Wilde on synthesizer and keyboards, Patrick O'Hearn on electric and synthesized bass, keyboards and synthesizers, Terry Bozio on vocals, keyboards, synthesizers, drums, and percussion. Reminder, I don't edit any songs into our episodes for copyright reasons, but down in the description, if you're listening to this on YouTube or on our blog at johnscotto.com, uh, you'll find links to Spring Session M on Spotify and YouTube, so you can listen along if you'd like. On to track one, noticeable one. This is one of my favorites. Love the opening riff. Um, just a comment for a number of songs. Del Bozio's vocals remind me a lot of Joey, Joey Ramone. Hmm. They were I, pretty I guess much contemporary. that. So I don't think, you know, he was a big influence on her. I think they have the same influences. Um, has a great groove. Love all of the overlapping harmonies in the chorus. Um, they were, as I've said, just completely overqualified for this music. Um, I love how <laughs> uh, Warren's solos are just spontaneously out of control and really nicely composed at the same time. And I love how it just kind of falls apart at the end. This is a they case where I... so much into this one, you know? I listen to this song a lot. It's There's three or four songs yeah. in this I, I listen to in, in a heavy rotation. Um, I've never heard the end because, as I've mentioned when we reviewed Smithereens in our test episode, um, or, or in our first episode, I think, first official episode, I usually yeah. don't listen to entire songs. Like when it gets to the chorus out, I usually stop it and go on to another song. So I never heard that bit at the end where everything just kind of falls apart. <laughs> well, I mean, this one does get a bit repetitive after about, I mean, three the three minute mark. So, I mean, <laughs> this one, I, I wouldn't blame you if you were skipping on this one. Normally, though, I, I'm, of course, an album person, mm. so I listen to everything beginning to end, kind of, mm. and how it works together, too. I used to do that when albums were a thing. I think I think it's more of a uh, streaming thing. Or it was actually, it was an MP3 thing um, when I was, you know, into, you know, the, the Napster and that sort of thing. When I had individual songs instead of an album to listen to, I, I didn't necessarily listen to the whole thing. Um, you know, what? it's funny, even during the MP3 days and the Napster days, I was making it a point of downloading the full album. Oh, wow. Like, it, it took a long time. It was like 10, to, you know, 12 tracks. Mm-hmm. So a lot, a lot of setting things for overnight. I'm like, okay, I've got about a third of the album. <laughs> Let's try again tonight. Uh, on to track two, Windows. Um, the intro had me thinking this might be the weakest, but then it picked up. Um, nicely, guitar tone, another vocal, very Ramones. Um, it gets a lot better in the verse. Um, chorus goes very commercial, though. Um, yeah, I, I liked uh, I like the Carnival, uh, you know, Emerson keyboards mm-hmm. under the verses. Yeah. Um, if the Ramones were Zappa level musicians and used a lot of synths, this is what they would sound like. <laughs> I mean, this could have been like a boring ballad. I mean, and the guitar during the chorus is just straight up yeah. lifted from Bowie's uh, okay. Teenage Wildlife from uh, Scary Monsters, mm-hmm. actually. 
Um, but I love Terry Bozia going off in the instrumental break um, and then just how insistent the, the bridge gets. He owns a lot of this album. <laughs> but he's also like one of the best drummers in the world. Yeah. So he deserves it. Uh, track three. It is one of the weaker tracks, though, I think. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think it went too long, first off, mm-hmm. because I don't think they had much past three minutes. You know, this, this band yeah. is just hit it and quit, you know. On to track three, It Ain't None of Your Business. This is my pick for weakest, but it's still pretty good. Um, loved the eerie synth in the intro, the tone of the synth bass. It's it's got a good verse. Again, falls down in the chorus, but I I do like how the instrumental break restates the cor- the intro. Um, I mean, it's a good example of early '80s pop, and uh, you know, I I think you know they had enough to go the three minutes here at mm-hmm. least. But yeah, you're right; they didn't do a whole lot with it. <laughs> Considering where the album goes, this is just kind of a warm up. <laughs> You're right. You're right. Definitely. Um, track four, Destination Unknown. This is one of their big singles. Um, loved the kind of creepy alien intro um, into a great guitar riff in the verse. This I is like, just a classic. Yeah. I love how Warren does a lot of um, call and response stuff with Dale. Yeah. Um, he, and he has also his vocal sets up hers in the verse. He sings yeah. the first line of the verse. Um, and the I kind mean, of yeah, I almost want to go with strongest for this one because it's just I mean, mm-hmm. what where can I add to this? Yeah. You know? Um, there's this kind of off time guitar stabs in the chorus, and then like the chorus repeats, but before it repeats, there's this kind of short semi solo. Yes, and, and then the second verse is really short. Then it just goes into another chorus. They knew they didn't have much. But they made the most of it. Right. Um, I love the rapid cymbal hits at the end and the chorus out. Um, on to track five, another favorite of mine, Walking in L.A. Um, great yeah, kind of eerie synth. Yeah, solid pop song. Hmm? Just another solid pop song. It's like a master yeah. class right. at writing pop music for, and, for at least this time period. You've always talked, often talked about how New Wave is basically prog meets punk. Oh, definitely. This, this band this exemplifies prime that. Prime example. <laughs> yeah. Love the eerie synth in the intro and the interda- interaction between the guitar and, and, the, and the vocal and the verse. Um, Del Bozio's voice is a bit of an acquired taste. But... There's some songs where it works and there's some where it doesn't. Like, uh, you know, I'm not so sure it worked on the t- opening track of... <laughs> You know, she was doing some weird shit with it there, but maybe it did work. I, I've heard so much of it that I, I, I've developed a taste and I love her voice, but I can totally, like Getty Lee, I can totally understand people who don't like it. Um, I think the male verse voice on the bridge is Terry Bozio due to some stuff he's yeah. done with Zappa. Um, he sang lead on some Zappa stuff. Um, I, incidentally, if you've never heard I'm So Cute, please give it a listen um, by Zappa. Um <laughs> Great guitar solo. I love how it goes off the rails in just the best way. Um, now, quick question. You mentioned sure. in the past you were a big Duran Duran fan back in the day. Yes. Were you still a fan when Warren came in? Um, Around, like, Notorious. He was the guitar player after uh, you know, the rest, the other two pieced out. Nah, I'd moved on by then. That was okay. too late for me. I, I want to go back and check out some of that stuff because it wasn't kind of in my wheelhouse at the time. It was a little too, like, dance pop. But I just want to go back to hear Warren. Um, I mean, I, I was, you know, a Duran Duran fan when I was like, what, 10? Yeah. <laughs> but, but by, you know, Notorious, I was in, almost in my teens. So, right. yeah, I, was I kind of started to like them around Seven and the Ragged Tiger. And then, of, of course, all the solo album, the, the, not solo, but Arcadia and Power Station happened. I love Power yeah. Station. So I was kind of into the, hearing them get back together. And that's when um, Taylor and Taylor pieced out. Yeah. Um, so I and I kind of gave notorious was notorious the first one back. I think it was. I think so. And I kind of gave it a listen, and it was just a little too synthy and pop- poppy for my tastes. But because um, Nick Rhodes was just left unchecked, right? And so that's <laughs> exactly. what happened. Yeah, you know. <laughs> On to track six, U.S. Drag. Here's where it gets fun. Uh, this gets really proggy. Love the off kilter timing. Terry just owns this one. Um, well, great guitar riff between the vocals. 
uh, and the turnaround, they throw in some Zappa chords. Oh, really? And some from really jazzy like Zappa chords come in on the turnaround. I love that. And I love how it gets louder in the second verse. The song huh. is just like completely off kilter. I mean, I, it really didn't grab me this one all that much. So I didn't really, mm, okay. didn't really get that. Hmm. I... Um, you there? Okay. Yeah. Okay. It sounded like you, know, you got disconnected again. On to track seven, Tears. Not a Rush cover. Um, <laughs> though the intro sounds a lot like what Rush were doing a few years later. I was thinking more English beat. It, well, the intro, like with the, the suspended guitar chords and the, the really insistent bass, it was very like a rush around um, Power Windows. Um, love how sparse the verse is. Great call and response with the vocal and guitar. The chorus does get a bit cheesy. Um, I think the chorus, they were going for a police. It's interesting you mentioned the police because... Terry gets very Stuart Copeland in the second verse. Um, right. Love the drum fills that lead up to the chorus. Um, and the kind of weird echoing harmonies in the bridge. And then like, he I feel does... like in the verse, they're definitely going for like mirror in the bathroom, mm -hmm. you know, English beat. Yeah. And then in the chorus, they're kind of getting into this police kind of flourish. Mm -hmm. But he goes very Copeland in the second verse, like you yeah. know, playing a beat ahead and shit. Um, great drum <laughs> fills in the outro. Um, and I love how they kind of, in the outro, just expanded the intro. I did like how they, they I mean, I can spot the influences. I don't think it's necessarily ripping them off, though. Mm -hmm. So I think I, I think they make good use of it. Yeah. On to track eight, Here and Now, not a Letters to Cleo cover. Um, I'm ignoring <laughs> the time, the, the temporal issue on that. Um, great opening riff, great insistent groove, more great call and response on the vocals and guitar. Love how the keyboard and the guitar con contrast each other. Chuck yeah, Wilde had these really kind of thin synth sounds that contrast with Warren's like really heavy kind of hard rock guitar tone beautifully. Um, the harmonies in the chorus more of a prog are... feel condensed down into this. Yes. And there are harmonies on the chorus that I describe as interestingly uncomfortable. <laughs> like they're a little off, and you don't know why, but they're interesting and kind of fun. <laughs> I didn't like the chorus until I got to it the second time, and then I kind of loved it. On to track nine, Words. This is another just absolute classic. I mean, it's good. I think Destination Unknown, I think, I always thought it was stronger than this mm -hmm. one, though. Like, they don't do as much during the verse on this one as they do for Destination Unknown. I feel... They, they leave Dale kind of trying to fill in the void with the squeaks and the voice and all that. But I, I just like the, the guitar stabs and how the synth just kind of shadows the vocal. Um, they do leave a lot of space in the vocal. Um, but they do some really nice things with, you know, the harmonies and the counter vocal counterpoint. Um, nice use of harmonics. The, the verse is really just for Warren. Yeah. More so than Dale. Um, Thank God damn the chorus is so good, though. Yeah. Um, and the bridge, the spoken bridge with the guitar solo behind it. <laughs> um, Darling Violetta did a similar thing with a song called Spoiled and Rotten. Um, clearly got the idea from here. Um, and I just like that idea of like, you're list you kind of have to listen to both at the same time or you miss something. <laughs> um, then we get a nice little short solo before the intro restates. And I just like how it builds at the end. Um, on to track 10, Bad Streets. Love the fast-paced intro, classic new wave, but with more jazz chords. Um, and then a great change into the intro. Um, Terry has these great kind of off-time snare hits in the verse. Chorus does yeah. get... get. Well, this album, uh, Terry doesn't really stand out all that much until you get to this song. And then it's like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> it like... stands out. You kind of have to listen for the drums to right, notice him kind, for a lot of the album right you kind of er, the first like nine tracks you gotta like listen for him mm -hmm. it in 10 11 and 12 you don't have to listen too hard to hear him. no no <laughs> he he's just like <laughs> he he's standing up and, and pretty much taking front and center i yeah. think with the last three right yeah 
Um, I love the off-time snare hits. The chorus does get a bit cheesy, but they elev- elevate it by getting very proggy. Yeah. Um, and then they get almost metal before the solo. That that is he doing like a double snare? Well, there's a, during the solo. During this, you mean a double kick? Yes. There there are some insane triplets on the kick in the solo. Again, it might be a double kick, but he is again one of the greatest drummers in the world. Uh, so it might be a single. Because I don't know, I don't know if Lombardo was doing that. No. In 82. Yeah. No. <laughs> Lombardo learned a lot from Bozio. Like, again, people talk about Neil and ba- Ginger Baker and, you know, um, Lombardo. Uh, you know, those guys. Bozio, what could, because it was he was in a new wave band and beyond that largely a studio guy, he gets overlooked. But he was incredibly influential. I mean, I'm really not even sure if he, you know, I'm, I'm more asking, of course, than, than <laughs> stating it, because I don't know what Lombardo was doing mm. this early in Slayer's, you know, history. I This was 82. Was Slayer even a thing at this point? <laughs> I know. I don't think they were. That kind of happened in the mid 80s. Yeah. Um, I mean, they may have been around, but, you know. Um, yeah. Slayer is the one of the big four I have that I never really got into. Uh, um, you know they they have their place. Um, so I'm I'm not they're the one I'm by far the least familiar with. Um, and then we have I have two favorites on this album <laughs> <laughs> because they're effective effectively one song and I can't pick. Um, starting with track eleven, rock and roll suspension. The ama- the opening drum fill is just amazing, and then he just Terry just goes off. Yeah. The, the, like these last three tracks it's just it's insane yeah like it, it, you know you feel like it's kind of on autopilot for the first nine like okay they're just doing the typical new wave beat kind of thing through this there's some things he throws in here and there but yeah the last three tracks it's just wait a minute where was this guy <laughs> <laughs> it gets very proggy love the weird eerie keyboards between the vocal lines um the chorus gets thoroughly weird but i like it uh, yeah. And there oh, are yeah, just definitely. these insane background vocals in the outro. They just, everything they learned from Frank, they threw into two songs. <laughs> and on to track 12, unless you have more to say about it. No, no. Uh, no Way Out, not a Jefferson Starship cover. Oh. Um, again, I think oh. that one was after this. Um, oh. What, because I referenced Starship? Yeah. Jefferson, I should say Jefferson Starship, different from Starship. Um, I, I think it was actually before this. I, I could be wrong, though. No I think out? it was okay, actually... Um, I think it's around the holiday start, you know, the Star Wars holiday special. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure. Um, anyway. I think. I could this, be wrong. This is also my pick for favorite because I have a dual favorite this week because I can't separate these two tracks because they transition right into each other. They do. Uh, and I think I just... I took the coward's way out and just took the big hit. <laughs> Hmm. rather than having to make the tough decision um a big hit as in you chose both of them as well destination unknown oh oh the big hit yeah big popular hit yeah um <laughs> i i just went with two because i can't pick um just the insistent drums also very proggy um it's just a continuation of uh, the riff in the chorus is fucking epic it goes very hard rock but also very proggy in the second verse and there's this kind of brief lead guitar ramp up to the outro that doesn't really go anywhere, but it's just this great kind of just chill up your spine. Um, they just took, you know, two or three songs to show, yes, we played with Zappa. <laughs> right. Uh, so do you recommend it? You know, before the last three tracks, I was I was on the recommending side, and then it was like, wow, they really drove it home. Uh-huh. Yes. I wholeheartedly recommend yeah, this. Yeah, I strenuously recommend it. Before today, I had only listened to a few songs regularly, and I hadn't heard most of the rest of them. Um, and the album was just a revelation. Um, they are the world's yeah. most overqualified new wave band. I have to admit, they're, they did three albums. The next two go seriously downhill. <laughs> um, this... I kind of got that impression, too. That it was just like they, they had lightning in a bottle here, uh-huh. and then... Uh... 
they shouldn't have come back for the other two. This, the second album is Rhyme and Reason is okay. It's just a little more commercial. Um, the third album, Color in Your Life, is just mid eighties pop. Del Bozio is still flogging the horse. She's out with a bunch of other musicians as moving per- as missing persons. Um, I would rather she just do a solo thing instead of bringing the invoking the band's name. Um, it's very you poppy. Eat. You gotta eat the. Yeah, true. And she wouldn't eat as much, eat as well with a solo thing. But right. But this album is a fucking masterpiece. I strenuously recommend it. Um, until next time, and we'll be reviewing Business as Usual by Men at Work. Fortunately, wow. I adore this album. So, you know, there, it was going to be difficult for anything to stand, stand up to Spring Session, Spring Session M, but Business as Usual can do it for me. Another um, 1982 new wave album? Yeah, I think that's why we put them together, because it was kind All of right. in the same vein. Um, yeah. We're, we're doing a hair metal thing after this. Um, okay. So. And so then, of course, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. Well, there you are. <laughs>